Inspirational Creatives, episode 151. Welcome to Inspirational Creatives. I'm your host, Rob Lawrence. Join me every Friday as I chat with successful artists, producers, and creative entrepreneurs who share powerful stories and strategies. They can help you to create the life that you want. Listen each week as these inspirational creatives show you how to take your creativity to the next level. You'll learn how to create a sustainable business that inspires others and gives you the financial freedom and lifestyle that you want. Thanks for listening. Make sure you sign up at inspirationalcreatives.com to get free exclusive bonus material. And now on with the show. Rob here and a very warm welcome to the Inspirational Creatives podcast. If you're new to the podcast, a very special welcome to Inspirational Creatives, where I share with you especially selected guests who wish to share their own stories and strategies with you to help you create a life and a living that you and your community love. If you're a regular listener, a very warm welcome back to the podcast after a short break where I took some time off to spend time reflecting and where I spent most of July speaking with you and other listeners to learn what you love about this podcast and how I can take it to the next level. I'll be sharing some of your own insights and ideas soon in a future episode, but for now, I can't wait to share with you today's chat where we talk about the challenges and benefits of more deeply engaging with your own audience. It's about how someone has fallen in love with their own audience, which is a topic deeply resonating for me right now. We also talk about music from a musician's perspective and creating an online summit, but don't worry if you don't know what an online summit is, we explain that too. So without further ado, on with the show, I'll chat to you soon. Today, I have the great pleasure of inviting back on the show a good friend of mine who, if you're a regular listener to the show, you'll recognise from episode 77 and more recently, episode 150. The reason I've invited him back onto the show is that this week he's launching a free online virtual summit for musicians. And I wanted to share with you an insider's view of what these online summits are all about, what's involved and what it takes to create them. I also wanted to find out why it's useful to take ideas from one field and apply them to another. So my guest today is Steve Palfreyman and his forthcoming summit features experts from the music industry who are choosing to share their wisdom with a wider crowd and deeper audience. Welcome back onto the show, Steve Palfreyman. Steve, welcome. Rob, thank you so much. I'm pumped, I'm excited and uh, I feel a little bit spoilt to be back. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> well, it's great to have you back, buddy. So let's start here. We've been chatting for, I've lost count now, but a few years now regularly on a week to week basis. And we mastermind effectively. We share ideas about what's going on in our lives and business. I really can't remember how long we've been hanging out now. Um, but we're both musicians. So let's talk a little bit about music because I don't think this is something we ever really do that much. And I'd love to get to know you a little bit more as a musician. So tell me about your history as a musician. You know, what instrument do you play? And are you playing right now? And are you in a band right now? Uh, I'm in a band right now. I'm not playing right at this exact moment. That would be uh, loud. Um, <laughs> Oh, that was cheesy, wasn't it? Yeah, so I'm in a band at the moment, and I and I'm really pleased you asked this actually because I don't talk about it enough. And uh, actually, I mean, there's a whole interesting insight into that. It comes down to I don't know that I feel like I'm ready to be out there saying I'm a successful musician. Mm. Um, I just feel like I am a musician, and I'm somewhat of just many musicians. So really, effectively, I am my exact target audience because I, like everybody else I'm trying to help, is still a struggling working musician. Anyway, I've been playing uh, for since I was nine or ten, uh, play guitar, and uh, still trying to sing on band number, I don't know. My current band is called Winter York. We, uh, we've been together quite a few years now. Me and my singer have been playing together since high school, so it's kind of one of those stories. It's going to be great when it works out because we're going to I'm sure look at each other and go, hey, we're that story of like two idiots who somehow didn't start hating each other after 20 years, <laughs> which is going to be fun. But yeah, we do like an indie pop sort of thing. And um, yeah, I don't know. It's funny. Like I, I feel myself being drawn further and further away from music just because I find so much joy in everything else I do. Uh, but I still consider myself a musician first and foremost, because without being a musician, I wouldn't be here. So I still identify as a musician, even though I'm not as active in it as I was even just a few years ago. Yeah, I completely relate with that. Tell me a little bit more about what music means to you in that sense then, Steve. 
It's interesting. I was reflecting on this the other day. Without music, I really, I don't actually know what I would have. I'm sure I would have plenty of great stuff. Like I don't, I don't think like I would be nothing without music. But all the big defining moments in my life have been linked to music in some way. Whether it's getting through a really, really hard time, and uh, there's been some plenty, plenty of pretty intense times. Or um, even just the other day when I'm feeling really overwhelmed by the amount of stuff I have to do for the summit. Nine Inch Nails made everything okay again. <laughs> like from every angle, there's either been a, there's, there's some music there I can put on that will change what's going on for me or down to more, uh, more practical examples. That first time I got asked to play in a band, uh, like that was, that was around, you know, that was when I was 14. Uh, I wasn't a cool kid. I was a shy, uh, yeah, I was a shy kid really. Um, I did not fit in that well. I didn't know where my place was. Luckily, I had some some guitar chops up my sleeve. And uh, one day I got asked by the cool kids to be in the cool kids band. And I was like, whoa. Like I like that was that was game changing for me because I was sort of started thinking, right, okay, so the world can open up to you if you put in effort. Hmm. And it wasn't the first time that I found that kind of thing. And and then I started noticing that when you put in effort with an end goal in mind, you can make something happen, even if it's out totally out of your control. And so by the end of high school, I met some guy, this is the guy I'm playing with now. I saw him play. I, I had my, my band and I knew we were going to be going to the same school together the following year for two years. And I saw him sing and play. And I'm like, I need to play with that guy. I'm going to play with that guy. I'm going to do whatever it takes to find my way into, like if I can find my way into this band, I can find my way into playing with that guy. Mm. Then it was, it was a bit crushing when like he started a new band and, and I'd started to get to know, know them a bit and they got one of the other guys from my band, but not me. And I was like, oh, damn it. Mm. But I didn't let that bother me. I just kept going with my guitar and kept, kept playing and kept trying to position myself around them and, Sure enough, like six months later, he wanted to start a new band and they asked me. That was quite a big defining moment that I probably underappreciate um, because that's one of the first times where I really went, I want this and I'm, I'm going to make it happen. Mm. What was defining about that moment? I, th- <laughs> I, I think a little, bit, uh, a little bit selfishly, I wanted to be in something that I knew would be successful. Mm. Um, like I, I was honestly like... I would have loved to have been a super talented singer songwriter at that age. What was I, seventeen, about to turn eighteen? Mm. Um, but I just couldn't sing in tune, and I didn't have. I should have done singing lessons and practiced that, and I tried a bit, but it was just so off-putting for me. Um, so I didn't feel like I had all the talent. I didn't feel like I had ha- I'd have enough, but I knew I could support. And so I thought he had the talent and I'm like, I want to go and head along with that talent over there, you know, hitch a ride with that, that guy. <laughs> yeah. uh, so I wanted a chance to make something happen. I think I just, I wanted, I wanted an in to make something in music work. That's why I decided it had to happen. And, and over time I was always looking for, well, gosh, if I don't have enough talent, what else can I bring to the table? And that's where I started getting interested in the marketing side of things. Um, and that sort of thing I find a lot easier um, than he does, for example. So I started looking for what, where I could add in extra value basically to make myself irreplaceable. That's fascinating. Yeah, I, I love the way you, you were looking for ways that you could add more value to the relationship in that sense. Totally. Yeah, I've never really liked the idea of taking more than, than what I'm giving sort of thing. It's never felt right. So uh, I think it was always, it always felt like it was important that I would have more to give in some way. But then it took on a life of its own. Like it stopped being about me just needing to give more. Uh, it started being more about, hey, guys, we can take charge of this. I can see things that I know you can't see, but just like trust me on this. Let's keep going because there is actually a hell of a lot of hope down, down this angle if we, if we follow the DIY route. How did the dots then connect up until where you are right now? with this summit that you're creating? Interesting. Um, very, very interestingly. I mean, a huge amounts of failure, like stacks of it over and over again uh, from both the bit and like the music industry side and also the band side. I mean, that, that band ended up breaking up like pretty devastatingly. 
Like it was, it was a pretty hard breakup. We were like four amazing friends living together. And, um, one of our best friends, like, like absolutely lost it with, um, with mental health issues, mm. uh, which was a really hard time. We just spent a lot of money. We'd sunk a lot of money into a record. And, uh, and it was around the same time, like I was working on a, on a grassroots festival as well. And that we got threatened with legal action, like a week out. That was, um, that was the first time that I ever swore that I would never, ever book 40 different acts for something. <laughs> I'm like, I'm never organizing something like this again. I was, I was running the talent side of things. I'm never booking 40 people for more than 40 people again. I'm just not doing it. <laughs> um, which funnily enough, I've just done um, <laughs> by accident. So that was, that was hard watch seeing that, seeing that kind of stop. But once again, a lot of lessons like, have your foundations in place. Don't sink stacks of cash into your record until like you've got an audience that is already going to consume it. Mm. Right? We've got, there's so much we can do to put things in place. So I think, you know, since then we've obviously started this new project uh, up with the same singer and we're still working away at that chipping away. We probably still haven't put in the time and effort that I think we need to. We've had, you know, countless roadblocks and sometimes it's just, I haven't had the energy to fully commit to the business side of it. All kinds of things actually have held us back, but we're moving forward still. And we've got some really exciting stuff coming up. I'm learning so much right now just by launching in a different way, in a different industry, stuff that I'm going to not only interviewing people, uh, but also actively doing it in a different way is going to make um, our next launch better than the last one, which was better than the one before and all that. So it's it's exciting times. It's just been a huge amount of failure to get to this point which i actually love yeah failure is something that you end up getting used to both as an artist and as an entrepreneur you were talking about when you were at high school there and the crushing blow that came when somebody else in your band was being picked but not you i mean it's very real i mean emotions are high at high school anyway but for me being in a band is you know the relationships are almost as close as they are if not closer than you are when you are in a family I mean, you've got people here that you really care about. You're all in this together and you have to, I suppose, implicitly trust each other. And to be part of that is a very precious thing. But to not be part of that and to want to be part of that can feel it very excluding, particularly when you have such a strong relationship with music. Could you talk a little bit about that and your relationship there in terms of how you emotionally connect with people and through music? It's a really interesting, interesting question. Um I think I was very, very lucky with the parents that I had. They kind of gave me two angles in the, I guess, the empathy world. And I think that's huge for a lot of artists that I know are hugely empathetic, uh, like massively. And, uh, and they, they don't realize that that empathy actually means that they've got a, a, a huge upper hand at marketing their music. Mm. Massively. Like they understand, they innately understand what people are going through, what their audience are going through, uh, yet they're scared to talk about it. And I think this happens in so many different places in the world that people are scared to talk. It's just not the way forward because everybody is out there going, well, I want to hear you talk. So why wouldn't we talk? Because people need to hear it. Anyway, that's a whole other thing. I think I was lucky to yeah, have, have parents on two sides of the coin, uh, both amazing people with their own, own challenges. But my, my dad was a, a therapist, um, a marriage and family ther counselor, actually. Mm. And my mom had depression. Uh, so I w had two sides. Uh, very, very lucky to be able to grow up with someone who I, had, who I like, wanted to help, um, but was always conscious of what I was always conscious of what my mom was feeling or thinking. At any moment, I was with her. And then with my dad, I was very conscious of how to listen and how to be okay and how to understand that that's separate from me and to basically like hone my own self-awareness at the same time that I was being empathetic. So I could feel empathy, but I could also understand what was going on. And that was a very, very lucky situation for me. So in that, that's changed the way that I think I feel about music and about musicians and that sort of thing. I, I feel like I've always been uh, looking very deeply. Even interestingly, like I, I don't listen to lyrics. 
So I, I don't know what most songs are about because I just don't. <laughs> I don't listen to that side of things. I'll listen to people if they talk to me. I'll listen to my bandmates, but I don't listen to what's going on in the song. I feel the song. And so I, that's, that's, that I find interesting. I'm sure I'm going to reflect on more when I'm older. But I mean, my dad always talked about feeling things and, uh, you know, and I was listening to my mom. So I'm sure there's a lot of lessons that play out in funny little ways that I haven't even realized yet. Yeah, that's amazing. Actually, it's funny because as you're saying that, I'm realizing that I never listened to lyrics either. How did your mum's depression affect you? Uh, I think uh, it definitely contributed to my um, my shyness earlier on in life. I, it definitely made it uh, like an uphill battle to make friends um, and and connections and that sort of thing. I, I can't even kind of like, like explain why all that much, but it definitely made things a challenge. Uh, having said that, it also set me up mm. because. I don't think depression rates are increasing. I've got no data to back this up. I don't think they're increasing. I just think people are talking about it more. Um, I mm. think, and I and I, that's just my gut feeling from seeing like other people in my family who haven't, who have clearly had depression their entire lives and have never opened up about it. Um, they're in that older demographic that don't know that it's okay to talk. It's a really relevant time that we're doing this. It's nice that this is coming up. It is okay to talk. And for anybody listening, please go and uh, come out and talk to somebody, anybody. Like even sometimes it's fun to talk to a stranger and I'll talk to you if you want. But uh, so I think, I think it's, it's really helped in the sense that I could understand and notice. And, and sometimes I miss it, but I notice when friends are going through things or even when clients are having clearly having a hard time. And I'm like, I know exactly what you're going through because I can see the signs because I've lived with them for a huge chunk of my life. So, and there's a really important lesson, I think, is it is like all of us are going to experience different levels of adversity in our lives. There would be nobody listening right now that wouldn't have had some hard stuff. Mine is not unique. It is just unique to me. Uh, the thing that I think is harder to do is to look at it objectively and look at the benefits that it's brought you. And even pain and tough things can, can make some amazing things happen. I don't think there's always just bad stuff in stuff that is difficult. And, um, and so I would, I would also challenge anybody to listening to um, take the moment and do the difficult reflection and reflect on the stuff that's hard and go, what has this brought me that is amazing? Because I guarantee like in all the bad things and tough things that have happened to me, there is great stuff on the flip side. Um, and that's what I hold close to me. The other stuff is at arm's length, not because I don't appreciate it or respect it, but because it doesn't serve me day to day, I can just let it be there. And, uh, and I think that's, that's a comfortable way for me to um, be with that. Yeah. I love what you just said there about how you don't think that there's just bad stuff in the stuff that is difficult. How do you believe your relationship with music has helped you with adversity? I mean, it's helped me massively. Like it's, it's, it's helped me find a tribe of people that are close to me and it's helped me, uh, just, just like exist happily by myself. It's helped me on like every single level. Um, it's kind of always been there. There's music in some way has always been there even since I was quite young and, uh, you know, my parents be playing like Pink Floyd records or something like that. It's always been there and it is, I think that's why people have such a huge connection to music even, you know, there's, there's not a lot of people you come across, they're like, oh no, I hate music, I don't listen to music. I, I have met people like that, but very rarely. Mm. Uh, I think because it is such a universal language and it gives every, it can give everybody such a unique experience, I think it's, I think for like anybody should make some music even if they can't play an instrument because it is such an amazing creative it's a huge creative outlet too i mean there's some of the best songs have been written because people have gone through huge amounts of pain mm. uh, so it's a great coping mechanism as well it's just it's uh it's like the ultimate the ultimate ultimate you can tell i'm a fan of music hey? <laughs> yeah. and i love hearing you talk about music it's just fascinating because there's so much that kind of rings true for me with that all in mind then, and you mentioned there about how music has helped you find your people and your tribe, 
Let's talk about this new tribe that you're creating or the tribe you already have that you're building further with this music summit that you're putting together. And one of the main reasons I wanted to get you on the show today was to talk about this summit that you're putting together for musicians. And uh, I guess the first question I'd love to ask you about it is what inspired you to create a summit? That's a, it's an interesting one. I, um, I would actually say uh, a, a, a thank you to, uh, to Jan Ilunga from uh, the Jazz Spotlight. He brought up uh, another guy, Navid Moazes, who uh, was basically putting on a summit. And he said, dude, uh, this friend of mine's putting on this uh, this summit in like the marketing industry. Should It's a pretty cool like concept. Should have a look. I'm thinking of doing one. This was ages ago. And I looked at it and I'm like, this is awesome. This is a really clever idea. And, uh, and that, uh, that's what sparked the idea. So, uh, so no points for coming up with the idea, uh, it was, uh, it was put in front of me and I went, you know what, that could be done pretty well in the music industry. And the reason why it connected with me is, uh, I've been to a lot of physical conferences and had a great time. I love it. I know every time I go, I'm like, I know I shouldn't spend all this cash going here right now, but I just have to do it. <laughs> hmm. I, a smart decision would be wait till next year. Get, <laughs> and then I'm just not that sort of person. There's a couple of things that, that happen when I go to these things. And, and the first one is I walk out of at least half the sessions and I go, why wasn't this question asked? And it bugs me because I, I see so many, uh, there's so many of the similar mistakes that I see. And it's only because if it was my, you know, my thing, which is why I've moderated, uh, if it, I was like, always like, if it's me, I would be training those moderators just to ask better questions. Mm. And so I guess that's partly why I wanted to host something and just see if I could give it a shot. Um, definitely not saying I've asked the perfect questions. In fact, I think I could, I'm definitely going to do better next time, but I wanted to give it a crack. So that's the first one. I wanted to make sure that like the right questions that are actually mean something to an independent artist who is in the trenches and not, not that hasn't already made it or is uh, 10 albums deep. I feel like maybe they want to rock up and they want to hear some big success stories or, or maybe that artist who's literally hasn't done anything yet. They want to hear the big success stories, but everybody else just wants I think, you know, a bit of, hey, here's something to do next. Um, so I've really approached this from the angle of kind of hint making each question have something that somebody could do. So even if you only, even if somebody rocked up and watched literally one question, they would have something to do that day. Hmm. That's the first piece. And the second piece is I find after you leave the conference, you're so pumped for like three, four days. And this is, I'm sure the same for anybody listening who's gone to any type of like uh, seminar, conference, physical event like that. Uh, you, you're pumped for three days. The, by day five, it's sort of starting to wane, but you're still fresh on your new idea. And then like a week or two later, you're back kind of to where you were, except you're more bummed out because you had the inspiration, but you feel like you haven't moved from beforehand. Mm. And so you actually end up going, well, now I feel worse <laughs> um, what have I done wrong? I feel a lot of the problem there is just the support network. I feel like if the conversation is there, you know, if like, if you could just have the 10 people that you met at that conference and you were just workshopping your stuff, like each day able to connect with each other and go, Hey, here's what I'm working on. Here's what I'm working on. What, how did, how did you go with your idea? You could collectively get a lot more done together. And so they're two of the big problems I wanted to solve with this which is why there's a Facebook community that I've started beforehand uh, and also why I guess I'm hosting it, trying to uh, ask some of those questions that are just based around getting, um, getting an action to happen. I mentioned in the intro that we often speak from week to week, well, we regularly speak from week to week, and I've been following your journey behind the scenes, so I know how much you've been putting into this. What's been keeping you motivated uh, partly our chats, to be honest, that's a huge, uh, like I, I, um, cannot say how important that, that has been to me over, um, just like staying on top of things, but from both angles, like being able to hear what you're doing and, you know, some days that's all I want to do is just listen to yours. And then some days I'm like, I actually need some help but having that, like, no barrier, two-way conversation has been more powerful than, than just about anything. So thank you. You're welcome, buddy. That and uh, I think the, the, the big thing that has made the biggest difference externally in recent times, it's been in the last six months that I've 
fallen in love with my audience again. Mm. And so, which is sound, might sound bizarre, but so when I first started this business, I, I would say I had a crush on my audience. <laughs> I would say we maybe, you know, we maybe flirted for a year, a year and a half and nothing really happened. Yeah, it was like, well, I don't think we're going to get married, but you're, you're all right. Um, I'm not sure why I don't feel the same as, you know, or why don't you feel the same about me as I feel about you? Those sorts of things. I think it's fascinating the similarities between any relationship, like a friendship, anything is all very similar. Mm. Um, but you can feel, you can have those feelings for a, a large group of people as well. And so early at the start of this year, I decided after committing to this one project, which is basically just building a community for musicians to launch their music. After committing to that, I decided that I needed to go all in on loving my audience. And I opened up and started feeling everything I could feel, not unlike someone who's gone through heartbreak in a relationship who's then gone, you know what, I'm ready to open up again. Uh, totally very, very similar. Uh, I've gone, you know what, I'm going to go all in on loving you and doing everything I can to help you win. And I'm just going to see what happens. And that has been a very magical process in watching people respond. You know, they don't, they don't see me there going, like sending them a million messages of a nighttime going, Hey, I love you. Like, it's not like, it's not quite like that, <laughs> but they see the care or they can feel the care. And I, and I know that because they're responding and they're responding to each other. And so I'm really just trying to plant that huge care in the middle and go, hey, you can all care about each other too. Just trying to lead by example a little, I guess, and bring a bit of love back into the music industry. Yeah, fascinating. I mean, there's so many ways to go with that. And I love what you said there about falling in love with your audience again and treating them with, with great care. Uh, what have been some of the initial responses that you've had so far? Uh, I mean, I appreciate it's early days yet. The, the summit's about to launch. It hasn't launched yet. But I know you've had some engagement with your audience already. What, what have their responses been like? Totally. Yeah. I mean, such early days. Uh, it's going to be really exciting to look back even just like six months from now and see the growth because it's growing. That's the main thing. The things that have, have stood out, like even today, uh, I got a message from somebody who's previewing uh, some, of the, some of the content from the summit for me. And they said, like in exclamation marks, dude, this is getting me my brain to work in such a way that it needs to work. That's paraphrased. <laughs> uh, little things like that. I'm like, damn, that awesome. It's hitting the mark. Great. Things like I've been experimenting in the Facebook group with posts to try and get people to, uh, to do things. They're all innately coaching styled posts that are designed to get somebody to do something. But I've tried different things. And, and one of them that's actually had more of a response than any is when I post share the love. And I'm like, Hey, the group's more fun with more people. If you have some friends, send them to the sign up page. And that's had a far better response from growing the community mm. than anything. And that says that says a lot. The thing that that like terrified me beforehand was what if nobody comes in? What if I, you know, I don't have I don't have enough, I don't have any money up my sleeve to invest in like artificially growing the group through Facebook ads or anything like that. So that's not an option. Like I don't have a backup plan to give it enough steam until it has legs of its own. It just needs to have legs, <laughs> which was scary. Uh, and it seems to, like it's growing every day. And the other thing has been the reaction to the summit so far. Mm. I've had um, huge amounts of people just pop up out of nowhere. Like, hey, I do stuff. I want to be a speaker. I'm like, oh, geez, didn't know you existed. Sorry, like I'm full, but um, let's keep talking. And uh so things like that and and like for me, here's, here's why each of those little things kind of like stand out is I decided that early on, I didn't like put amazing stakes on this. Like to me, if nothing grew, I wasn't going to care. Like I, I was still going to care about the people in there, but I wasn't going to beat myself up if, you know, if I got to a hundred and it stayed at a hundred for a while and it was slow for a bit there. You know, that 100 to 150 people in the group. And I knew that was going to be the hard point. I knew it was going to, getting to that 200 was actually probably the hardest bit. And now it's just got some steam. So I knew that, I knew if it just did stop, that it wasn't going to be a problem. You know, I wasn't going to go, right, that means I stop. I'm still going to keep going all in. 
until I find a way that I do find something that does connect. I'm just so, so over the moon that I found something that's connected faster than I expected. It caught me off guard. So now I feel like I'm winning far more than what I was expecting to be winning at this point. And that's just by having like huge goals, but very, very reasonable expectations. Yeah, that's that's really cool. I love the idea of being really ambitious, but at the same time, kind of being mindful and dare I say it, realistic in terms of you don't know what kind of outcome you're going to get. You've got to put it out there and then you can assess the outcome afterwards. But that doesn't mean you you necessarily go through the process with any less degree of care. Absolutely. I, th- I think it's really important like for anybody listening who's maybe stalled on something for any period of time because of what that outcome might be, just assume there is no outcome and get started anyway. Mm. Because even if you get three people in that group and they're having a good time, then what you're doing is worth it. You know, if you're touching one person's life, then you're making a difference. If somebody's all in on you uh, and what you're talking about and you're helping them, then you have a duty of care to find another. There is definitely another person. Like one, one person is proof of concept. The first person who bought a VIP pass to me was just, and that was enough for me to go, right, if one person wants this before I've even given you anything yet, and I haven't even announced the lineup, then that's proof to me that I, that I need to keep going. That's my fuel. That's another log in the fire. Uh, and I, and I, I would just challenge anybody to get out there and get started on that thing that you've been putting off. I wish I started this a year earlier. Mm. I was going to, I had the idea a year earlier. I really think I would be well over a thousand members now if I started when I had the idea, which crushes me a little, but this is great because you can learn from me. If there's something you've been putting off, just do it uh, because there's so much talk out there of success and, hey, I did this cool thing. And that's why I'm really pumped to be here at this stage because I haven't made it yet. You know, this is literally, we're just in the, we're exploring the creative process of putting something else together. And I think that's really important to see because I had this idea from exploring somebody else while they were putting theirs together. And I just think you can get so much from looking inside something as it's going along and knowing that it's not about the end result. It's not about, oh, okay, look at that amazing thing that they did. That's in, that's inspiring. I really think the best inspiration comes from, hey, that person is slogging it out because they want to. That's what I would be inspired about anyway. So I, I hope I hope if anybody's listening and they're like, damn, I should just get started on this idea that I've had that I was scared about putting out because I didn't know how it was going to go. Just do it anyway. Because if it stuffs up, then cool. That's awesome. <laughs> like <laughs> Break it. Make it stuff up. You're only going to do something else better next time. Yeah, absolutely. And I, th- I think those stuff ups too are the opportunity for you to be able to go, okay, why do I think it's stuffed up? And what other ideas have I got that I'd like to try to see if it doesn't stuff up the next time? And then kind of repeating that cycle. 100%. There's so much in there, Steve, really. I really love that uh, the, the idea of just like, you know, having really big ambitious goals and just getting started anyway and not worrying about the outcome. But I also love the fact that, you know, all it takes is one person to agree to your idea or to like your idea. And that is permission to keep going forward. So let's talk about the actual summit itself. I mean, there may be people that have uh, been listening to this so far and they're like, I still don't quite know what a summit is. So in your words, what? how would you describe what a summit is and what your summit is? I guess it's really a, a video podcast on steroids, <laughs> <laughs> essentially. The idea is, and, and they can run in different ways. Next time I really want to have a lot of live stuff happening, especially with the way live streaming is going. I just, uh, I was too nervous about doing it this for this one but so basically i've pre-recorded a bunch of um interviews which i'm calling master classes because they're not so much about the exploration of anything other than like actionable stuff so i'm like come and you watch this episode and you're going to have a whole bunch of things to take away and work on so they're workshops it's kind of the way i've, I've made them uh, come about but with video so you get a nice little nice little experience the idea with the, a, a virtual summit is each video or if it's a live session, people can come along for free and, and watch it. Each video is sort of available for a few days. The idea there is to give people a nudge to consume an action. And I see this so much, and I've done it myself plenty of times. If there's no reason to consume something today, then you're just going to leave it till tomorrow, unless it is like the burning pain. 
but then that thing you leave till tomorrow becomes the burning pain. So I'm really trying to kind of, instead of giving people Panadol or antibiotics, I'm really trying to be like, here's some freshly, freshly steamed broccoli, get in on it. Uh, and you got three days to eat up or it's gone. Hmm. That's the big nudge that I'm trying to make there for people, especially artists. We're awful procrastinators. I mean, <laughs> I just told you that I didn't do this thing for a year. <laughs> uh, so we did a little kick. <laughs> um, so that's part of the reason. And the other thing too is, so it, it also gives opportunity to then, I knew it was going to take a lot of work and it is taking far more than I ever imagined. It's it's actually quite enormous mm. just with the with the amount to do in terms of, I really want to do a podcast after this. I wish I did a podcast before this, <laughs> but I really want to do a podcast after to go for more down like a, just a fire and just keep throwing content out there. I think, I think they should exist together actually. So the idea with the summit is I can monetize it on the back end by having VIP passes, which mm. means people get access forever. Um, and I can also throw in other bonuses. I'm doing some extra workshops at the end. It's also a way for me to go and see who are the ones who just, you know, just want to dabble around and maybe and see who this really serious people in my community are because they're going to come in and and be the VIP and they're going to work with me in depth. And in fact, they're already working with me, the ones in already. Um, I'm already helping them more than they probably realized they would get straight up. And then the the speakers are winning as well because they get the advantage of not just being a, a weekly kind of show where each week someone gets on the spotlight. It's like everybody's promoting together, which I'm trying to get press around it as well. I'm getting press around it as well with huge thanks to Angela from Muddy Poor, my publicist. Amazing, amazing, amazing work she's doing on this. And we're just trying to build a buzz and go, hey, there is a community here of people who work together without asking for anything in return and they'll help. Um, so it's so at the end of the day, it's a big way of just kind of making a bit of a mark. But I kind of see it as like a value proposition where everybody is winning. I'm winning just by putting in the effort to put it on. You know, I'm not. I don't. I'm not even really giving strategies or anything. I'm not even p- trying to position myself as an expert here. Um, indirectly, I'm, I know people are going to come and be like, "Hey, Steve, what do you reckon about this launch campaign?" Which is what I want to talk about which is cool, but I'm not even doing it in that way. I'm just getting other people to do it. And I think that's the huge takeaway Mm. is it's not so different from putting on a gig, putting on a physical event. It's not so different from putting on really anything where people can come together. But the big lesson that I haven't missed at the start that I'm realizing more and more now of why this is working is because I've made a show for everybody else and, uh, and I'm just facilitating it. And that's why I think the, the reaction is so strong at this stage. That's awesome. So you're kind of a ringmaster of your own community in that sense. Yeah, yeah, basically, uh, which has been a nice uh, adjustment. And I'll, I'll just say this, before when I was talking about um, falling in love with my audience again, first time around of trying to grow an audience, I was very much thinking about how do I position myself as an expert? Because around that time, that's what everybody was talking about. Okay, do these th- do these five things and you'll position yourself as an expert and talk in this way and they're going to trust you and what to do if you haven't been in the business for long and you need credibility and th- all those sort of like kind of ideas and tactics were out there at, at that stage and it was like, hey, you know, go and do your thing because Tim Ferriss said we should. Um, mm-hmm. All credit to Tim Ferriss, though, I wouldn't be here without his book. But there was just a, like a lot of message around that. So I thought I was meant to be out there doing that and it really didn't gel. I mean, the times when I was fluking it, it was gelling. And it was literally because I was just, when I was just winging it, winging things and not putting in the thought, a lot more was happening. Mm. And I think that's that's fascinating because because uh, now I'm approaching it of, in all honesty, love it when somebody emails me and says, hey, let's talk about launch strategy. That's like, I'm so pumped about talking about launches, not just for music. Um, I find it fascinating and, uh, and I, I always have. I love it, getting the attention about that, absolutely. Uh, but I'm not, that's not my end goal at the moment. It's absolutely not my end goal. And that's where things have changed, even though it's something I, it's a nice side effect. Hmm. My end goal really is for people to be helping each other and working together. And if I can see that that's sparking something in people, then I know what I'm doing is working. In my mind, I've moved myself away from like top down share message with tribe to I'm on the outer edge with the tribe 
talking to the tribe and really just need to spread the message around. We're all on the, on this flat circular surface where we're all just like crossing between and working together at different points. Mm. That's kind of how I'm seeing it. We're all just sort of there. And, and I even see that even the speakers I see on that same level, you know, they, not all of them might see themselves there. And there's some big names here who definitely don't need to come down to the circle, so to speak. Um, but they have by joining the summit effectively by going, okay, I'm, I'm in with you. Then I'm here going, well, this is how we're playing the game. And we're, we're all, whether, whether it's day one or day 4 million and 89 in the music industry, <laughs> we're all in this together on the same page. And that's what I really am trying to instill from, from this whole thing. Yeah, we're all in this together. Absolutely. Uh, it's really interesting what you were saying there. It reminded me of um, Tim Meek earlier in the series under completely different circumstances, but he was talking actually about home education at the time. And he was talking about how things today are much more about the guide from the side rather than the sage from the stage. And uh, it very much reminded me of what you were just expressing there in that sense. Um, so what would you say, Steve, like given everything you've been through, you're just about to launch the summit. What have been your biggest lessons so far putting this all together? Well, you know what? There's a funny one. There's a funny paradox there. I really want to say have more of a foundation in place, but then that's what I was trying to do. And that stalled me. So I'm, I mean, I'm so out of my depth but I know I've got this like at the same time. Mm. Uh, and that's really fascinating because I really think you just need to get started and, and figure it out while you're, you know, while you're swimming in the deep end and the sharks are following you. Like, mm. we're, we're just going to keep going now. <laughs> like there's some really awesome stuff in that. I think it's balanced probably quite well because every moment I'm going, right, that's what I need to have in place to not have to do this same task like eight times like I'm doing at the moment. Mm. And I'm getting much quicker at what I would have done previously is go, all right, that's what I'll do next time. Now I'm going, okay, I'm taking 15 minutes extra and I'm doing that now and I'm testing that new foundation idea. So I'm redoing things over and over with even as I'm going now, putting in just that bit extra work because I'm like, if I can get this going well now, then it means next year when I do this again, that'll already be in place. Mm. Once again, there's a funny little, there's a funny little thing with growing anything, isn't there? Like you need audience to, to be able to kind of get your project to that next level. But then without the audience, like it's really hard to get like any press coverage, for example. So how do you get press? Well, they're like, well, you need audience. Like, okay, well, let's go back to the audience. Like, ah, but I don't have one. Like there's always so many different things that hinge on other things and you just kind of have to grow them up mm. together. I think that's why this summit has worked as well is for everybody listening, I didn't know most speakers on the summit before I asked them. They didn't know who I was. I didn't even have like a Music Launch Hub website up. Hmm. Uh, I've literally gone and thought about the different leverage points I have at the beginning and where I can use where I can use those. And so, for example, to get some of the bigger names, I knew I needed A, a good bunch of people um, who were already on board and I needed some big names already. Well, how do I get those? Well, I need to go to some people that I I already have a relationship with who are going to help me at least with the introductions. And then I needed to have a more compelling offer for all of those speakers every step of the way, every time they got introduced. And so I think that's just one little lesson that's played out. I was always thinking about how do I, how do I make sure that next person I reach out to is getting more than, than what I'm, uh, more than what they're putting in. So it's almost like continuously building momentum in that way. Totally. Yeah. And all at once. Like, I think everything really can be brought up together if you just work on one project. I think that's really important. I think it's really easy to get, like at the moment, I'm not spending enough time on the marketing. I'm so thankful for the publicity campaign because without that, there wouldn't be as much, nearly as much going on. And that's just because I'm one person. Uh, I think it's really important for anybody with a project to understand that there's more than one spot that needs attention to kind of start building up those leverage in, in different areas at, at once. And it's not about just suddenly having a thousand followers. It's about having a little bit of a marketing push that's happening while the project is moving forward and then going, well, the community um, outreach is going forward there and my relationships with connectors is going forward there and figuring out the different important pivotal areas that you need to get 
that project to where it needs to be and making sure each one is being watered essentially, even just a little bit at the same time. That's been a huge lesson to kind of feel that something is working based on actually doing that um, and feeling the response on those different angles because it was just a hypothesis beforehand and now I'm like, okay, I can see that this is working. This makes so much sense for any project. Water all the different pivotal points at the same time and don't expect sudden perfection just water each bit fascinating yeah that's that's really good food for thought before we wrap up what would you say has been the most inspiring talk or conversation that you've had when putting the summit together it's an awesome question um gosh i actually don't know that that i could pick one one speaker uh, and that's kind of why it got turned from a Originally, I was going to have like 20 or so, and now there's 40 plus. I've actually got 50 confirmed tentatively, so it'll be 50 or close to 50 by the time I'm, it's out, and it was going to be 20. And what happened was when I started realizing that an artist's launch wasn't just about the marketing, I'm like, you know what? I know a fantastic singing coach who can talk about songwriting and making a great live show, and I'm like, that's launching music. And then I was like... Rob, you need to be a speaker as well. <laughs> like artists get stuck all the time and they need to hear from people who are an actual artist who know how to help people get unstuck. And I think the really awesome thing has been opening myself up to seeing that everything is a piece of the puzzle and everybody plays a part. It's a super tough one because and I'm sure you'll find this interviewing people too. There's like different things you start loving about different sessions because I'm, I'm I'm looking at all of them at the moment and actually because I've got people watching the sessions for me for editing uh, I'm trying to recommend them sessions they'll enjoy and it's getting me thinking about them all again and you know I, I thought of one of my favorite ones today but that was only my favorite because it plays to me I love watching like Gary V talk because it's all fast paced and it gets me pumped and there's a couple of sessions that came to mind that are like that but that's not everybody's taste. Uh, so I think the thing that is most exciting is anybody can rock up to this and they're going to find like two or three sessions of people that they're like, this person speaks to me and they're going to go and follow their stuff and their journey. And they're going to go all in on those people. And, and I reckon there's something for everybody in, in this, which I'm pretty excited about. Fantastic. And which was the session that really stuck out for you there? The two that I, w- I was really excited about, I was Graham Cochran from The Recording Revolution. It was an amazing, amazing chat. And one that was funny because I didn't expect it because I met, got an introduction through, I, I just reached out in a Facebook group going, is anybody in the music industry in here? And somebody connected me with a, a guy named Philip Ryan Block from Independent Ear, a, a label in the States. And it's like it went for far too long. Editing that down is going to be interesting. It went for like an hour and 20 minutes. And I'm like, oh God, stop talking. This is great. Stop it. <laughs> this is fantastic. Stop it. <laughs> so they were particularly exciting. And, like, and they're totally different topics. There's how to make a great mix at home. And there's how to build a movement within a record label and how to start up your own record label. Like they're totally different things. But just as pumped about, um, actually, the other one that I thought was really good on a different pace was Ariel Hyatt's uh, talk on crowdfunding. I think is really good because she lays out that lays out something that artists find so difficult, but in like a really manageable kind of thing. And that's just a taste. It's just a tiny taste. And uh, and of course, yours too, Rob. I think is going to be huge for people. And uh, and 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 the folks watching should just come and uh, listen to Rob talk about. Uh, talk about mindset strategies and just living a creative life, which I think is so important for people. And that's the other thing too, there's a lot of stuff in there, which is you know, not just music specific, which has been really cool as well. Yeah, I'm really excited about it. So for our listener, when is the virtual summit? Yes. Uh, so 13th to the 30th of September, uh, it'll, be, it'll be streaming for free. Each session will stream for three days for free in that time. It's a really cool opportunity for anybody watching who might be curious about doing one to come and watch what I'm doing uh, and just get an inside look at how I'm running it. You know, it's not uh, it's not perfect by any means, but I think I'm doing a pretty good job of it. So uh, it'd be a fun thing for people to watch. So yeah, in the last two weeks of September. And um, if anybody is an artist or work in the music industry or know anybody that works in the music industry, they're going to 
absolutely love it. They should come and join the community. The Facebook group's free forever. That's in fact most of all of this that I'm doing is free forever. So uh yeah, come hang out. Fantastic. So where can folks find the summit and the Facebook group that you just mentioned there? Yes, uh musiclaunchsummit.com. Uh you can get a free pass to this show and uh and you also get an invite to the Facebook group there too. If uh, if you happen to be listening to this after the summit's happened, then musiclaunchhub.com, uh, you can find the Facebook group at, at any time. That's fantastic, dude. Well, thank you so much for your time today, buddy. Thank you so much. It's been, uh, it's been my most open interview I've ever given. And uh, I can't tell you how much I appreciate you, uh, you making me just like dive deeper than like ever before. You're an amazing interviewer and, and a huge inspiration for, uh, for everything that I've, I've put together. So I uh, thank you just on every angle. <laughs> <laughs> oh, thanks, buddy. You're welcome. Thanks for listening. Nothing beats the stories and advice of an expert to help you raise your creative game. I would love to know what you thought about today's episode, so don't forget to subscribe in iTunes where you can rate and review the show. If you like this episode, I invite you to share it on Facebook or Twitter with the one person you know who will benefit from the wisdom shared here today. You can find the show notes on inspirationalcreatives.com forward slash podcast. If you have a burning question or a great idea for a guest, head on over to inspirationalcreatives.com forward slash contact where you can connect with me there. 